I'm Margaret Stoll. Uh, welcome to our panel, which is uh, The Hero's Journey, How to Tell a Strong Story in Video Games, because it is the most creative panel title ever. Um, and I'm joined by my uh, friends and cast of extremely talented game writers, uh, Jill, Josh, Sam, and Charles, and I will let them all introduce themselves to you. I'll say uh, I've been working in the game industry for a very long time, so I won't tell you how long, let's just say decades. Um, going back to my experience on a, a magical machine called the PlayStation 1, which was uh, Spider-Man. Um, and I've been working in and out of the game industry with Activision, with Bungie, with EA, DICE, um, and kind of all over the place since then. Uh, and uh, Jill, why don't you kick it off and uh, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jill Shar. I'm just realizing that I made the mistake of joining this Zoom first, so I went first in your order, so I won't make that mistake again. Um, but uh, I, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a lead project writer uh, at uh, Harebrained Schemes in Seattle. Um, before that, I worked at Bungie on the Destiny franchise. And Sam. Hi, <laughs> uh, I'm Sam Maggs. I'm a freelance consulting writer in video games. I've worked for studios like Bioware, Gearbox, Activision. Uh, all I've worked all over the industry. I also write comic books and video games. And uh, yeah, I'm, right now I'm working on the next Call of Duty. Are you allowed to say that? Do we need to shoot you now? <laughs> no, no, no. They, they, they didn't say the title, but we're good. It's and gonna I be another Call business. of Duty. Cod <laughs> sniper light has not shown up on my forehead, so we're okay. Sam, Sam and I both work uh, with Marvel quite often, and between Marvel and and Activision, you have to be careful where the uh, the uh, NDA police will appear. So we're okay. gonna You're going to get a letter. <laughs> uh, sorry, did you say me? Me, I'm Josh. Uh, so I bounce between doing uh, writing novels and doing world building and development on that front. And then uh, in the game industry, doing mostly level design. And I have a strong focus on kind of in environmental storytelling. You know, how do you weave the narrative into the level that you're traversing? That's a very exciting topic to me. Oh, uh, I should note, I'm currently working on Blanco's Block Party. Uh, I spent a hot minute on Guild Wars 2, uh, like 15 and a half years. I spent uh, an even hotter minute on Ori and the Will of the Wisps at that company at Moon Studios. Uh, before that, Descent 3, a little bit of Red Faction. It goes, it goes way back. Deep cuts. Nice. OK, Charles, you're up. I am Charles Beecham. And I am a writer at Mythical Games. Uh, I work very closely with Josh, uh, and I've worked a little bit with everyone here. Um, Sam, uh, Sam and I are just friends. We've met at things and been great. Um, but uh, uh, I got my start in storytelling at Marvel as an editor there. I worked on a lot of really cool comics from Miss Marvel to Black Panther and the crew to the Guardians of the Galaxy, to the Inhumans, to the Star Wars books. Um, and that was lots of fun. And then my oh, friend, oh, and of course, the great Captain Marvel uh, with, with Margaret Stoll. Um, what was I thinking? Uh, um, hello. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, and Margie's actually the reason for my transition to games. She, uh, she helped me uh, make a transition over into gaming um, and, and working on the Destiny franchise uh, with Jill at Bungie. Uh, and that was lots of fun. I worked on some comic stuff there. Um, and now, like I said, I'm at Mythical working on Blanco's Block Party, telling really cool stories about toys that come to life. And it's uh, lots of fun. Um, and I'm just stoked to be here talking with all of you guys. Well, we're happy you're here, and uh, we're always happy to have this conversation, which I've been having on and off with most of you for a long, long time. Um, and I think that's a, a place we could start, is we've all seen with sort of the rise of the game industry and the mainstream culture and the rise of games as a service, we've been seeing these sort of like platform-based storytelling um, and world building with these like long enduring worlds that can stand up a bunch of different media. 
Um, and I think as a result, the kinds of stories we tell are changing and the way we develop characters and also I think the way broad culture understands the role of, of the game industry. Mm -hmm. um, but what have you guys seen change in the course of your story game careers to get us where we are now? Sam, with your, uh, I know you can't tell us anything about Call of Duty, but if that is your most recent project, is that as a marker to like where we've where we've gotten from where we've been. Yeah, it's interesting. When I joined the industry, my very first job was at BioWare because the kind of games I was attracted to as both a player and a writer uh, were like narrative heavy, character focused games. And even like 10 years ago, BioWare was kind of the studio doing that. And over the last decade, we've seen that kind of model be adopted by more and more studios and more and more places have kind of come to the realization that like gameplay is obviously hugely important and paramount in a lot of ways, but tying that into a really strong narrative and really strong characters that players connect with is what takes your game from like a fun game to like a legendary or like a classic game. I'm wearing, I worked on Ratchet and Clank, which is the shirt I'm wearing right now. Uh, the new Ratchet and Clank that just came out when this is out. And uh, that was something that we talked a lot about working on that game was making the game feel like a Pixar film, making the story feel like a Pixar film. And I feel like that's something we wouldn't have heard in the industry even you know, 10 years ago when narrative kind of was like an afterthought in mm -hmm. a lot of ways. And so it's nice as a writer to be in a spot in the industry now where people recognize that like writing is equally as important as like the gun feels feel good, which is yeah. also deeply important. No, I think we've seen people begin to prototype creative content in a way that they normally um, only prototyped game mechanics and and sort of the tech behind a game, which I, which I think is pretty fascinating. Jill, I've seen some of your character work on the Destiny franchise, and um, I've also seen some of the uh, passionate email you've gotten from players who've been so excited to see uh, Anna Bray and the, one of the first queer characters. Yeah, from K, yeah. Stood up in that, um, in that universe, Dev from K, right. Uh, what has it been like to, to sort of be so involved in, um, in really broadening how we think of game characters like that, telling more, uh, you know, more inclusive story? Yeah, I mean, I, I can't take any credit for Anna Bray. That was uh, other folks uh, at uh, Bungie and uh, Vicarious Visions. I did get to write for her in a comic that Charles uh, held my hand through the whole way. Um, so thank you. Um, and that was awesome. But no, um, he yeah. didn't include that. On, he also <laughs> didn't include you in his list of uh, comics credits. So we should we'll have a talk with him afterwards. Sorry. Guys, I've made a lot of comics in my life. A lot, a lot. <laughs> Humble no. brag. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was into your character development because I, I really noticed that from working with you, Bungie, you you always held character to this high to like the standard of one of Charles's, you know, uh, comic stories or really a novel. Like you stop you, it. Ah. No, you really you developed like non like not what people thought of as game characters. I mean, you really developed. You went for it. And I wondered what your thought process was there. Thanks. Um, I just like, I think that I'm like really occupied with trying to make characters sound like real people. What that's like my like project. That's not every writer's project. Like there's, you know, sometimes you want a character to sound like heightened in a way or like comedic or something. And I'm, and I, I love to consume stories like that. I love, you know, watching and playing all those things. But like when I write, I'm like, so uh, hungry for like characters to sound realistic. Uh, and sometimes that takes me down too deep of a rabbit hole. Like sometimes I'm like, people people stutter and they say, um, a lot. Like maybe we should put that in the story. And then I'm like, no, no, no one wants to listen to that. Like get a grip. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, Devrim uh, was, it's just kind of, you know, we he was conceived as a character who we wanted to show, um, like in Destiny you play as these like super powered, uh, like awesome soldiers, like literally super powered soldiers. And, um, you're always going on really cool adventures and and for this moment in the game saga we wanted to show you like you just lost your powers in the story and so we wanted to show you like what's it like for a normal person in this kind of dangerous like you know futuristic kind of post-apocalyptic world um 
And uh, Devram was kind of that role. He was the normal guy. And uh, he's just like someone kind of just trying to survive without the, the ability to, um, you know, turn magic uh, into weapons uh, at his hand. And we just had this scene where we wanted him to be chatting with another character. And we wanted to show that those two characters knew each other well. Um, well, and how do you show that? Well, like they would, they must know each other's families then. So, okay. So then the other character like mentions Devram's husband and it was just, it was just that like, and that kind of was where it started. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, he, uh, he came out and he's uh, like the, the, the game came out and well, I guess he came out, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, yeah. And, and uh, the, the fan reception was like, was really, really, really nice. And I was, I was really happy to be part of that. I, I think yeah. I was just gonna say, like for me, one of the, the, the really cool things about moments like that um, is is that it, it really does just let people see themselves in the game. It, it really has no effect on on what you're doing in the game, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and lots of times as a writer, as a storyteller, right? Like we are we're facing this this uh, this con a consistent problem of of explaining to people what you need to do, right? Um, but balancing that with uh, making them feel something about what they're doing, right? And, and it's anytime when we can hold up a mirror to them or shine a light on you know, a real experience, that's the stuff that makes you feel like really invested in the game. And so like, I, I love that example of, of a time where, where you were able to hold up a mirror to the world and, and, you know, and, and let people say, oh, hey, like there's people like me in this world and that's awesome. Do you that's think that's part of one of the, oh, sorry. No, <laughs> I'm cutting you off. No. I was just going to say, like, I think that's one of the reasons why I'm so glad that Josh is on this panel with us as well, because, like, telling a strong story in video games is about so much more than just the writing in the same way that, like, telling a strong story in a comic is about the art and the letters and the colors. And in games there, you know, the writing is just one such small part of telling the story and like level design, environmental design, art, all that is such a huge part of it too. No, I, I'm super interested uh, to talk about environmental storytelling and also incremental, right? Sort of object-based storytelling. Like what, what are the ways you can tell a story when a player is experiencing a story as change on a map? I mean, Josh, what do you, what do you use in, in sort of building a world story? Um, I think what I, typically start with is the very broadest strokes of where are we in either the world or the character's narrative arc mm -hmm. and make sure that the lighting, the spatial um, structure and everything resonates with that. If it's a dark, scary time for the character, it should be a claustrophobic dark area. And if it's jubilant, I've just got my superpowers and I'm flying through the air, it should be bright and vibrant and open, right? Just utilizing the basic um, palette of art that you know works across all mediums that mm -hmm. everyone understands when it comes to to these things like composition and lighting and color and and all that kind of stuff so and then from there it just it really comes down to the specifics you know are they are they in a mode where they need to discover something you know in which case it's cool to leave hints around um, the environment, uh, you know, if a big battle happened here, what did that look like? Um, I get excited about kind of digging into the details of that probably too much. And I spend too much time thinking, okay, well, during the first uh, part of this battle, uh, team A pushed team B back into this dead end and then team B rallied and, and or flanked them or whatever. And I'll make sure to make the area tell that story. I think very few people notice it, but for those who do, it's pretty exciting. And I think whether you notice it or not, you know, as a, a famous YouTuber says, uh, your brain does, you know, so. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree. Pattern recognition, right? People, people do process when details yeah, are subconsciously it, it's in there. Yeah. Charles, what has it been for you the move from, from like linear you know, storytelling on the page to game development. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's funny, as Josh was talking about the way that he uses the environment to help mirror a character's journey, um, I couldn't help but thinking about how, how often, um, especially now, like the game that, that I'm working on, uh, Blanco's Block Party is 
Um, it's not really a narrative driven game, but we have a lot of narrative elements in it, right? Um, and, and thinking about like the hero's journey and, and, and how I use that right now, it's really about the world changing. It's about introducing new ways that the player is going to interact with, you know, with the junction, which is our, our social hub space. Uh, the new ways that uh, the new toys that we give players to, to use to build their own levels um, and introducing those things as big world change moments. And, and it's almost like the world becomes the main character, uh, mm -hmm. which is very different um, than like in, in my time in comics, right? Like when the world changed, we were using that as a catalyst for, for, introducing the player or not the player the the characters and the stories to something terrible or something good that that they had to then react to right and in this way it's like here's the world player now you can go and interact and have your own experiences in your own story um and we're just going to give you these new little beats and these new milestones that that are going to affect you uh, as we go Ooh, there's nothing i love more than a good state change like yeah. you, your character chooses a dialogue thing or shoots someone and then the whole world changes as a consequence of that action. Very expensive, very hard to do, but mm, every time, mwah, you yeah. you'll love to see it. Yeah. But that is, I mean, what is change in an unchanging universe, right? Because you know change, one thing the game industry teaches you is change is expensive, right? Yeah. <laughs> change yeah. involves new models, change involves sunsetting, you know, all kinds of things, change is a big deal. So that's, I think, one of the things I've struggled with the most is, you know, stories have arcs and characters have development and change is expensive. So like, how do you evolve and sort of keep having it matter to the player, you know, when- And developing that story in games is so asynchronous. Like when you're writing a book, you write the whole thing and then you edit the whole thing and same with a comic, but it, games have like, often AAA games have like a six year development cycle sometimes. And there are certain parts of the story that have a long lead time, like PCAP scenes that you have to write like the first year that you're working on the game and then get shot because then all of the wonderful Pixar artists who then have to light it, you know, make it look like a movie have to work on that for the next three years. Uh, but of course, things change over the course of the six year development cycle. And sometimes your whole story or your whole game can change, but you already made that stuff way back then. So you're either like a lot of the time you're locked into that and then you're trying to use like in world dialogue to make the rest of this story make sense with the rest of that story, the two things that don't really work together anymore. Or if your studio has a lot of money, they're like, well, we'll just reshoot it, which can also be a curse. Because then they're like, just reshoot it a million times. And then there's never any <laughs> consistency or like nothing's ever finished. Cause they're like, why does not do it again for a $10 million or whatever? Um, so yeah, it can be that the time dilation iteration is, is weird in games. I really well, liked watching, oh, sorry. I just, I liked watching Josh's face when Sam said that she likes a world state change. She had the sort of haunted like, <laughs> yes, panic? but no, but yes, but no. <laughs> exactly. I've got a great a good story expression. about that uh, right, whenever we're ready. Well, Josh, <laughs> oh, yes. I, I did want to ask you, um, one of the frustrations, I mean, I too love a world story. I love ownable detail. I love like, you know, when the world is captured in pieces and things that could only happen in your world and your game. Mm -hmm. But I find it so difficult in game development. I find that um, creative teams are not, often built in a way to facilitate everyone building in the same direction. And everything mm -hmm. is sort of siloed where the writers often are like, you know, often a hub, or if you're lucky, a writer and a narrative designer are at least paired and, and working together. Mm -hmm. But like the idea of having a designer and an artist and a writer all on the same page and the guy paying for it, like how are you able to pull that off? Especially in quarantine when we're already just like, by nature, <laughs> siloed. The guy right. paying for it discussion is like a whole other situation too. Like, but really, how do you have to like ha get you know those priorities across? To is not necessarily ever in the room, right? So that's yeah. no. It, it's actually funny, Jill, that you brought up quarantine as a challenge. Um, actually, in my experience, I've seen it the inverse because a lot of times when you're in an office in meet space and there are like 
meetings set up by production, right? And they, and they book the room and then the people who are invited go to that room. Like so much of that stuff is structured in such a way that it's not necessarily going to facilitate a kind of mixing, a free mixing and um, more like a, a volunteerism where mm -hmm. there's no problem to poke a person on Slack or Skype or whatever and be like, hey, I've got this idea or I'm doing this and it might, it might impact you. And so it actually relieves the burden of, I, I, it adds burden from the production side in a lot of ways, the, the working from home thing, but it, I think it also alleviates it in others. And I found that the ability to just reach out very casually to people in all different departments mm -hmm. has actually been increased. And I think this is a challenge, like the, the siloing challenge is across all mediums. Like you can look, you can usually tell a movie that's had, you know, several script doctors and reshoots and, you know, all those kind of like behind the scenes shenanigans and problems, um, you know, the best films, the best movies, the best comics, you can tell when everyone is kind of working, shooting in the same direction. And I think a lot of that comes down to either just an inherent shared vision that everyone has, but more often than not, it's just a very strong creative director that is good mm -hmm. at gathering the consensus of the team and what everyone is actually excited about and then mm -hmm. articulating that. And that's a, a process that needs to reoccur continually throughout, like, like Sam was talking about this many years project Things are going to change. The design pillars often change. The tech pillars end up like driving design to change, which then drives narrative to change. You know, so it, it's this never ending cycle of trying to make sure everyone's, you know, you're herding the cats in more or less the same direction. So, yeah, it's a really challenging thing. But when you get it right, that's when you end up with really great things. I have a T-shirt that says, sorry, I'm just the writer. Uh, which I think like goes a long way towards explaining how I feel about games a lot of the time. And the fact, something that people don't really realize about games, which is this team buy-in element, because I think a lot of people assume that as a writer, you have a lot of control over the story of the game. Yeah, just sorry, Chicken said, <laughs> you don't have any, you have very little control, I would say, because you are a very small cog in an otherwise very big machine, which makes sense when you consider the fact that uh, the publisher is giving you like hundreds of millions of dollars to make a thing and so they want it to be good like that's totally understandable and then you might also have the IP holder like if you're making a game like Spider-Man or whatever and Marvel owns those characters and wants to make sure that you are treating them in the correct way and representing them in a way that does good service to their characters so that is also totally understandable but then you also have the person who owns the studio, the person who runs the studio. Sometimes there's people with garbage bullshit titles like chief creative officer who kind of have no job <laughs> except for to like be like, I have ideas or whatever. And then there's a creative director and then there's a game director and a lead writer and a senior writer. And it, like, it's just, there's, so, and then there's the rest of the team. Like, it's a lot of people who have to agree with the thing that you want to make. It's, I believe it's, it's chief vision officer. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Mm -hmm. I, um, yeah. I mean, just speaking to that, like, I, I feel like thus far, my most positive gaming experiences have been working with small teams, right, where there's not a lot of the red tape, because you're able to have those, like, you know, to Josh's point, you're able to have those very uh, direct conversations with people who are making the decisions, and, um, you know, I, I think any, all of us are familiar with the term narrative rapper. That was a thing that for me coming into games was, I was just immediately like, what are you, why, what? <laughs> no, like, like story matters so much more than just like packaging on the outside. Um, hey, it works for you explain that and is? Donkey Kong just fine. Come on. Sure. You want to explain? Just in case but, know. but, you know, I, I think one of the things that I, I found like uh, when I, when I was very, First starting out in games like I was very prickly about I was like I don't I don't like that I don't want to hear that term and and I found that it's a lot more effective to talk with people about how everyone tells stories not everyone's a writer right but everyone across all disciplines is responsible for telling stories and building a world that people are going to be engaged in uh engaged in right like that like that's that's the kind of been the mind shift for me. Um, and, and I feel like I've, it's been a lot more productive. I, I actually totally agree with that, Josh. I was listening, I mean, Charles, and to your point, Josh, as I was listening to you talk, I was thinking, you know, how much of 
my job over the years has been just getting people on the same page. And I think that that's actually a thing, the game industry, and sometimes actually the writers in the game industry, we're sort of terrible too, because we're so used to people not listening, right? That we tend to like, you know, we're like the owners of story and we don't necessarily want to invite a designer to give us his story take or an artist, right? Like you want to be like, I'm, I have narrative expertise. It's what I've trained in. I want to drive that. When in reality, in a truly collaborative medium that games are like, you have nothing to lose by bringing a designer and an artist into your story conversation. Yes. And you will get buy-in at the very least. You may get an idea you didn't have because they are storytellers. Like, I think we have to be better that way. I think my, big, my biggest struggle has been, has been learning when I don't need it to be said in dialogue. I don't need it to be yeah. written down in words. And it's like, oh no, Josh can tell this story by building this cool thing that people can see. And now, and now they know it's, it's communicated to them in a more impactful way for games, right? Like, um, yeah. But I, learned, I had to learn that from Joe Casada. I learned that from Marvel <laughs> Chief Game Officer because when a, right, I was a novelist first. And when a novelist starts writing comics, you overwrite everything. You, you're like, yeah. no one can see the beautiful art because you're mm -hmm. ballooning or covering all of it. And Joe, when we were working on Life of Captain Marvel, remember this? Joe finally said to me, that's not your moment. Like, back off. That's the artist moment. Like, zip it. This isn't for you. And I was like, oh. And, and in games, it's like, hey, that's not your moment. That's the mechanics moment, right? Like, that's the cinematics moment. That's the, you know, like, whatever it is. Like, it's, no, you don't need the dialogue. Just let the thing, let the player experience it. Um, yeah. That's Combat is character. Part. Yeah. Go ahead, Sam. Sorry. Oh, I was just going to say that's the other interesting part, which is that uh, I would say that like reading a book or consuming a comic or a film is like a passive medium, whereas playing a video game is a very active medium. Like you are the protagonist. You are the protagonist. And so there's this extra layer of like when the player character does something, we are forcing the player to do that thing. And so there's this whole other like meta layer you have to think about when you're writing a video game that you don't really have to think about in other mediums. Like something that I fall prey to all the time and I always have to stop myself and delete and rewrite stuff is making the player feel bad for a thing that you're forcing them to do. <laughs> um, because like in a book, the protagonist could kill someone and then you could make the protagonist feel really bad about that because killing someone sucks actually. Like that's a bad thing that you did. But like in a video game, I made you do that. And then I'm also going to make you feel bad about it. That makes me like, that's not fun for anybody. And that's like, that goes triple for when you have conversations with branching dialogue or an RPG. Like you have to make sure that the choices that your the player is making, their player character make, like co correspond to the things that they actually want to do in the game. Um, so there's this extra like agency layer that complicates things. Well, which is just why Undertale is so genius, right? Because mm -hmm. Undertale like directly points at that and is yeah. like, yeah. you know, how like is it what? doing part of this story yeah so. I think it's like like taking on and off I call it like the the writer hat and the player hat because mm. sometimes like if you keep the writer hat on too often it can be easy to say like oh well we can't we can't give you this fourth option because ah budget and we don't have the animation budget and or whatever but if I put on my player hat yeah of course the player wants that I want that like it is a really intuitive thing that a player would choose and so like you know switching between the two um it's tough especially when you start to get into like crunch you know, you know, uh, like, uh, you know, down to the wire, I should say, like, uh, you know, we don't have time to redo this or something like that. We don't have to add this, but. Um, I'm know, glad always, you mentioned like, budget yeah. as well, yeah. too, because I, I made a couple of TikToks recently because I'm 17. No, I'm 30. <laughs> um, I made a couple of TikToks recently about game and how it, going over budget. And a lot mm -hmm. of people were like, what do you mean over budget? Like, it's just words. Words are free. But words in video games are not free because then those words have to be localized, which means translated into every other language the game is going to be in. They have to be performed by a voice actor who is directed by a voice director. They then have to be animated with like lip flap and all that stuff. And in the case of like PCAP scenes, they have to be fully animated. Like you, you very quickly run out of cash. So in mm -hmm. a game like Dragon Age Inquisition, which is almost a million words, you can see how that budget is important like yeah 
the number of times I have like thought I really just like just got it just under the wire for a piece of flavor text or something. It's the exact number of characters. It's it's perfect. And then a localization uh, expert comes back and is like, look at what this looks like in German. And it's just like German. spilling everywhere. It's always it's German. German. It's always German. <laughs> <laughs> it's always German because the rule is that if you anything in German doubles the character count. So you think you think you get it just under the wire in English and then German is just like I get, oh. I get flashbacks when it's brought up because I was taking the textures that were made for um, Red Faction and I had to up-res them for the port and also localize them. And so we had all these like smooshed down little, I don't know, like 128 textures of, you know, a sign that has the, the glorious leader and then some thing under him, but it's like all smeared out and you're like, oh boy. So I either had to make something up, talk to a writer, and then try to fit the same amount of information in German, like baked into the texture. And it was always just like, nope, sorry, the font needs to be like three to get that. <laughs> yeah. There's all kinds of weird rules like that, like cult different cultural rules too for localization, like uh, certain games that are being ported to certain different cultures, like can't show beheadings or can't show ghosts or can't show people on fire, um, can't talk about alcohol, can't use certain swear words, all, all that can show nudity. So you, you oftentimes have like different versions of the same game or if you can't make different versions of the same game, you have to be really aware of that as you're writing, like the number of children's games where there's a bar and they drink something green because you can't have them drink something that looks like alcohol yeah. is very yeah. like- Yeah, and there's markets where- one. There's markets where uh, they don't, like LGBTQ stuff is is banned or won't be sold, um, and that is uh, like a, you know, it's it's not a good excuse, uh, but it's something that like publishers have to navigate. Like, I mean, for example, uh, I, I think in Russia, like you you can you can uh, release games that have LGBTQ characters there, but they will up your rating. It will become from like a T to an M or something. Um, and it's there you are know, other parts of the world where it's um, you know even stricter and and um, that's a, that's something that like the you know the guy who's paying for it uh, you know ha like weighs that and it can be it can lead to some shitty conversations. Well, and it becomes really interesting in a truly global marketplace when game funding is so multinational and you are accountable to a, a bunch of countries you may not even realize originally you're accountable to. So but it absolutely uh, changes things. Does anyone have a story they want to share about the uh, time they accidentally gave a game a teen rating because of all the swearing in Russian and drinking they put in? <laughs> <laughs> that might have been red alert retaliation. I'm not really sure. And it might have been me. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> uh, back in the days of the talking head, full motion. <laughs> Yeah, FMV. I think I got really bored, and by the end, the Russian general is standing on the desk, like hitting golf balls off a shot glass. It's swearing in all the Russian I could find in a Russian cursing book or whatever. But uh, have you gotten yourselves into any narrative jams? Nope. Uh, uh, I did. Uh, I th uh, I'm slightly a little bit responsible for the language descriptor on Destiny 2's uh, T uh, rating um, because um, there's like a secret, like people have found it. I think people data mined it or we set it to like play like one in a million times, but um, there's a ghost uh, line. The ghost is like your kind of your um, helper companion. Um, and there's just like really like intense high energy moment when you get your powers back and we were trying to find a line for that was gonna really like, you know, uh, what's this line that's going to make it feel like a cool power fantasy moment? And uh, I don't know what I was thinking, but I was like, I pitched Twinkle Twinkle. <laughs> Why? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and then somehow it got recorded. And then somehow it wasn't actually in the, it was, it wasn't in like the playable game, but it was in the data. So like it was data mineable when we sent it to um, the ratings boards and they found it. And then they gave us the ratings descriptor. And then it was like, well, okay, now we, we've already gotten docked for it. So we might as well put it in the game at the, um, you know, one in a million thing. So yeah, I'm sorry about Twinkle Twinkle. I remember you counting Great. profanity. That's a t-shirt. Right? Like, yeah. You... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, our editor at, at, uh, on Bungie, uh, Cookie Everman, had a, a beautiful sequined throw pillow that said, in curly script, script uh, it said, make count. <laughs> I got one version of it. <laughs> <laughs> that was very good. 
No, but that's a really interesting uh, thing you're reminding me of, which is that uh, when we worked at Bungie, uh, Cookie Everman, who was an editor there, like now is a novelist who, you know, had a, a big book come out. Uh, you know, Charles- Called We worked, Belong. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Charles worked in comics and works in games. Now, Sam, you've written across the board, nonfiction, fiction, you know, comics, games. Like, Jill, I know I've seen your novel as well. I mean, like, writers really are moving across these these uh, genres and platform limitations, do you think that that's like, does that sort of dimensionally change the work we do in any one of those fields or, you know, does working in the one start to influence your work in the other, et cetera, et cetera? I, is there I, really, inter oh, go ahead, Charles, go ahead, please. You, you first, you, you start. Oh, I was just gonna say, there's a really interesting thing that I notice happening right now, which is that TV writers all wanna write video games and video game writers all wanna write TV. Um, and so like the whole industry is full of TV writers who are being like video games, that's like the key to stability. Um, but game writers are like, but in television, you get royalties and you have a union and we all like all look at each other. Like everybody has it better than everybody else, but like, we're all suffering. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's really interesting. I feel like a lot of us have this sort of grass is greener mentality, but that's, um, I don't know. Then there are like insane people like me and Margie who just decided to write everything. Um, That's what I was, I, I mean, Margie's one of my role models, right? But like, uh, so I probably get a lot of this from her, but like, I'm, I want all the grass, you know, like I, yeah, you literally. <laughs> yeah, I want all the grass. When I, when I, when I approach anything, I'm thinking, and, and part of this is probably my Marvel, my Marvel training, right? Like I think about anything as IP. I think about it as as not just, oh, this is a game. I'm thinking about how can this be, like what is the Saturday morning cartoon version of this? Mm. And, and what is, you know, what is the, the major motion picture and, and the comic and the action figures and, and all of, and the video game, right? And like all of that stuff, because that's where the real, I, I feel like that's when, when, when content really becomes transcendent is when it can exist in all of those places. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I feel like that's gonna only happen more and more. Uh, we're seeing like the major streamers, like they're pulling from everything, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, and the, the big studios are pulling from everything. Um, and uh, so me and Charles have been working together to develop the very nascent uh, graphic novel based in my own original IP. And, you know, a lot of the discussions we're having is about franchises, how they work, how they started and where they're going. And like my, my innovation, if there is one, is, you know, and many other people are obviously thinking along the same lines, is to say, you know, I'm not making a media uh, or a like artifact in this medium. I'm making a world that will have expression in all yeah. different mediums. So like mm -hmm. Scarred King, this is our first novel, right? Buy it now on Amazon today. But, <laughs> uh, but as I'm working on these novels, I'm putting in tons of illustrations. I'm doing visual development and world building and sinking way more time into the kind of infrastructure for storytelling that can propagate into other mediums. And I think, I think that's probably the future that storytelling is going to be is, is, your, is writers are going to need to be able to inhabit all these different mediums and like switch between them well and know how to play to, to strengths without contradicting or undermining the other medium. Because I think right now, that's where most of the franchises suffer the most is mm -hmm. that every you know comic and movie and TV show tends to undermine or contradict each other. And I think there's ways around that, but it's, it takes a lot of forethought and you, should, you need to build that structure into your IP to begin with. It's also oh. where writers who are looking to cross mediums run into a failure point where like a lot of, like say a TV writer wants to work in video games, like you can do that, it's all storytelling. I wouldn't say it's like, it, you're not curing cancer, like you can do it, but there is a learning curve. Like there are certain yeah. things that you have to know about writing video games that are different than writing a television show or a comic that just are, um, and you learn them when you get into the industry, but you have to be willing to learn them. Like it's not helpful to come into video games and be like, I only write in Final Draft and I won't be flexible because like most of the time I write in an Excel spreadsheet. Hell and yeah. do I like it? No, it blows. Obviously it blows. <laughs> I also would love to write in Final Draft all the time, but like you can't. This is a video, but, like it's a different thing. You know, you have to be willing to learn. 
I would say though that you and I have recently worked with like a Hugo and Nebula award nominated, whatever mainstream writer who we brought into games, who was the quickest study I've ever worked with. In Absolutely. Terms of games. And that was about attitude, right? Yeah. So it wasn't actually about sort of like, um, you know, like an aptitude, I don't even think for the- Like a willingness. It was willingness, yeah. right? Yeah. Which I think is amazing and something to always keep in mind. Yeah, there's like, this thing that can happen where someone from a different medium will, uh, I call it, they will Kool-Aid man through the wall and be like, <laughs> here it is, like, here's my genius. Now you can do whatever you do with your toys and make, you know, and it's like, no, that's, that's not how this process works yeah. at all. Josh, I totally agree with what you were saying, by the way, I call it foundational IP and I'm obsessed with it, but I, nice. it is intentional world building that considers first the world and then sees the sort of, the product is, is really a product line. And it's, you know, everything that comes out to communicate that world. I think we're actually out of time. Well, we this did a really good job talking about the hero's journey, didn't we? Oh, yeah, we crushed it. <laughs> Listen, Listen, the title was meant to be ironic. Nobody yeah. in video games likes the hero's journey. Nobody likes Robert McKee. We all hate using, these are all okay, tools really? in a writer's toolbox. They shouldn't be rubrics. That's it. It was a joke. I'm going to keep telling this forever. Let's go out on a throwdown. Greatest game narrative of all time. I'm going to start you Portal 2. Mass Effect 2. Shadow of the Colossus. Oh. Why are you doing this to me? Right? <laughs> Throw it down. Come on. Okay, so the Josh, Josh, Josh picked my, probably my second choice. Um, I'm... Rapid fire, Charles. Rapid fire. You know I'm gonna pick Fallen Order, but like that's not fair. <laughs> I'm just it waiting for you to say yes, yes, yes. Right? Like I felt things. Fallen Order, you said it. Yeah. It counts. Okay. Uh, Breath of the Wild. I love Breath. Breath of the Wild. It's a very quiet game, not a lot of dialogue, but it's just so happy to. It's just a happy place to be there. I've been listening to the Look soundtrack the again lately. It makes in me our happy. Best narratives. It's so interesting. Okay, well, uh, I love you all. Thank you for having us. Uh, thank you, faceless viewer. We hope to see you in a flesh at a fleshy flesh con in the future, a meat con. And um, we're out. We'll see you. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Bye.